Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Respected brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to week six of the ICNA ILF Quran webinar series. The title of today's seminar is Compete for worldly gain or strive for Allah's forgiveness and reward. We'll be studying verses 20 to 25 of Surah Al Hadid. And today's webinar will be delivered by Sheikh Abdul Rahman Khan. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass over to the Sheikh. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Bismillahi Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi Amma Bad. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, we will be doing the tafsir of Surah Al Hadid, chapter 57, verses 20 to 25. And we will start with a little introduction of this portion that man's the competition is part of man's dna our very beginning is about competition where out of millions of sperm cells only one will come into contact with that with the egg and fertilization takes place by the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so competition is part of our dna but the question is what are we competing for in this world what is this race in this world all about? Or what should we be com competing for? What should the race be about? And so in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of everything that exists, guides man to what he should be striving for. And in the process of this competition, what pitfalls he should be aware of, what concepts are to be understood, and if we do it right, uh, we will set our priorities right uh, in this world as we return back to Allah. Competition is between two things, the life of this world or the akhirah. This is the competition that these verses uh, bring about our attention or bring our attention to. And each one has its own focus on the way we live our life. If, we, if our competition is for the worldly things of this life, our life will be structured differently. And if we, are, we set our priorities to how we live those life, if our, our focus is the akhira, then our life is structured differently. Our priorities are set differently. And so verse 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولهون وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد كمثل غيظ إذ أعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون هطاما وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد ومغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور. And a translation of that: Know that the life of this world is nothing but amusement and diversion, adornment and boasting to one another and competition in increase of wealth and children, like the example of rain whose resulting plant growth pleases the tillers, the one, the farmers. Then it dries and you see it turn yellow and then becomes scattered debris. And in the hereafter is severe punishment and forgiveness from Allah and his approval, his pleasure. And what is the worldly life except enjoyment of delusion? So what happens when the life of this world becomes the center of what we do? What when the competition 
uh, of this world, of this life and the material things become the center of our, our entire life. So we put that in the center there, al hayatu dunya the world of this life. And Allah talks about six things. La'ibun and la'ib, amusement here is about the heart. The heart desires. It is coming from the desire from within. You want to do this, you want to have fun, you want to have uh, your life set in a way that it pleases this inner ego and inner uh, desires that is there. And lahu, time wasting, is what the body or the limbs will fulfill what the heart desires. So la'ibun wa lahun wa zidatun. And zina is a word that is used to mean something temporary, an adornment that is temporary. It is called zina. And boasting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning these six things in the verse that they are la'ibun, lahun, zinatun, tafakhurun, and takathurun fil amwal. You compete for wealth and wal awlad. And the competition is there with children, or the boasting is there with children. So while boasting can be general tafakhur, but Allah specifies that these are the things that have become, uh, when our life is centered around material things in this life, and all we care for are worldly life and worldly pleasures, then these are the areas that we will find surround most of what we do. For people who, uh, is centered around the life of this world. It is play and amusement. And so the body enjoys its fun and the heart becomes negligent. They spend their time planning for enjoyment and amusement and the consequences is negligence and forgetfulness of Allah. And they are blinded of what is ahead of them in terms of warning and punishment. So in terms of what is coming after this life, there is no concept of that. There is no, you know, sometimes people think this material life and what Allah has blessed them with in a good job or in some uh, wealth that they have, their car, their business, their house, their family, Oh, that Allah must be pleased with them to give them all of these things. And so, um, you know, like the two men in Surah Al-Kahf, he is the first one is blessed with gardens and, and children. And he becomes so pompous that he feels that this can never go away. And if he were to return to Allah, um, there is better in store in him. Such people, even Dean, becomes fun and amusement. And today with all of this... Uh, you know, uh, equipment that we have, we find a number of our younger generation, they are even in the khutbah, even in the masjid, uh, the, the phone and the, you know, whatever goes on on their phone becomes more interested to them than in the khutbah. So you have to call out. Sometimes I, you know, khatib calls out and these are teenage you know, middle teen, later teens, that they are playing in the middle of a khutbah, they are playing. And even going to the masjid becomes a social act if what is there in this life becomes uh, just the center of their life. And so you find in many masajid, fighting to control what goes on in masjid becomes a political game and a show of ego. And even Islamic work can be affected if this boasting or bragging or showing off riya comes into our activities. If we read the hadith, where a martyr will bring up, be, you know, be there on the day of judgment, an alim, a generous man. It's a long hadith. You can read it in Sahih Muslim. 
that they will be brought forward and they will be questioned. You die as a martyr. You know, what happened with your life? He said, I die as a martyr. Allah said, you lied. You die so people can say you're a brave man. Similarly with the alim, so that people can say you're, you're a knowledgeable man or you are a good reciter and a generous man, you know, people say these things. So we have to be careful that in the process of returning to Allah or this, this life, the life of this world, if we are competing for it, then these will be outcomes of that and then Allah tells us about what is the reality of that. Kamathali ghaydin ajabal kufara nabatu. Thumma yahiju fatarahu musfarran thumma yakunu hutama. The example of that is like the plant grows, it pleases the one. Uh, kufar here is the one who plants. It's one of the meaning of, of uh, kufar or the planters. Then it dries and you still become yellow and scattered. So... Allah brings simple similitude so we can see it. So this is a beautiful garden. You know, the planter plants that. Wow, it looks beautiful. Then it becomes dry and then it becomes debris. So the same garden that looks so beautiful, this is what this life is. Eventually it dries up. Eventually it becomes like, you know, pieces of wood that will, or chips that will fly with the wind. So in the Akhira, what is there? There is hellfire and there is maqfira, the forgiveness and pleasure of Allah. This is the choice we have to make. If you take up all your attention to this dunya, most likely, and you did not prepare anything for the Akhira, in the Akhira, Azabun Shadid, there is a severe punishment. And if you did prepare for the Akhirah, there is maqfirah min Allah, he rabbu one. Wa mal hayatu dunya illa mata'ul ghurur. And this, just like how the flower does not last, similarly, this life is just a deception, it does not last. And so the real competition is what Allah says, Sabiku la maqfiratim min rabbikum wa jannatin arduha qa'ardi sama'i wal ardi u'iddat lil ladhina amanu billahi wa rusuli. Race towards the forgiveness from your Lord. Now, this is the real competition for the forgiveness of your Lord. Not how much work you do, but forgiveness from your Lord. And a garden whose width is like the width of the heavens and the earth, prepared for those who believe in Allah and His Messenger. That is the bounty of Allah, which He gives to whom He wills. And Allah is the possessor of great bounty. So, the competition is not for the dunya, but for maqfira, pleasure of Allah. So whatever you do, you do for the pleasure of Allah. You do it so that Allah, and that is why when we finish our salah, what's the first thing we say? Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Anything we finish, we say alhamdulillah. We begin with bismillah, we end with alhamdulillah. So that all praises and glorify, glorification is for Allah. So this competition is for Jannah. This competition is to avoid sin. This competition is for doing good deeds, doing pure Islamic, sincere Islamic work, to do dawah for the pleasure of Allah, to take caution of those things that bring about the pleasure of Allah. You compete for those things. We, our belief, to make sure that our belief is proper with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For that, we need education, we need time. And so the next verse, Verse 22, Allah says, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي أَنفُسِكُمْ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مِّنْ قُبْلِ أَنَّ نَبْرَأَهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ No disaster strike upon this earth or amongst yourself except it is in a register before we bring it into being. Indeed, that for Allah is easy. So Allah is telling us, Whatever you possess, whatever you get, this is already there written for you. Don't feel it is your energy and your, your life. And Allah brings this aspect of qadr so that we believe in the qadr of Allah and we do not believe that this thing happened just because we are intelligent and we are good and we are smart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about this competition and then know our material gain is only by the qadr of Allah, not by our efforts alone. So be thankful because boasting shows ingratitude to Allah and brings about the nafs. And so qadr here, just as a quick 
uh, glance that Qadr has four stages, the knowledge of Allah, writing down uh, in, the, in the book, and there is a writing down for the beginning of the creation, and the yearly and the daily, and then the will of Allah, and then the happening of that uh, event. And so Allah says, explaining that understanding of Qadr, in order that you do not feel hopeless over what has you have missed you and nor rejoice in pride over what he has given to you. So what you did not get, you do not feel hopeless because you believe in the Qadr of Allah. And what you do get, you do not become proud over what you, what he, Allah, has given to you. And Allah does not like everyone self-deluded and boastful. And so whatever Allah gives to us, our uh, behavior, our belief is to, whatever we possess in this life, we know that it comes from Allah. It will return to Allah. So even when death comes, what do we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We give what is due out of that, giving whatever possession we have, we give to the poor and the needy because Allah has placed this wealth as an amana, and I do not claim the ownership of that. And so do not be saddened with what the hearts aspire and did not get. Have patience. All of this is written in the Lawh al Mahfuz, and there is no way to escape it. So, no need to be proud with what Allah decrees for you. Wallahu la yuhibu kulla muhtalin fakhur. Allah does not like every, everyone or anyone self deluded and boastful. You know, kibber is one of those sins of Iblis, of Shaitan, that he had kibber. By just rejecting you know or this kibber this this uh, arrogance that led him to his downfall and so what is this kibber about and so allah says describing this kibber and this boastful attitude who are stingy stingy in spending in the way of allah sincerely and enjoin upon other people stinginess and said don't don't give for you know, don't you don't know what these people are doing with your money don't give them don't give for masjid don't give for that don't, but you can spend to enjoy your life so you do two things here you two evil qualities those who are stingy and enjoin upon others stinginess here means don't spend you know, it's not like Bakhil, you just only own and, own, you know, you hoard your wealth for yourself. Uh, it means that you also do not want other people to spend in the way of Allah. And you turn away, then Allah is free of all need. And he is praised for he's, he, everything belongs to him anyhow. And if you hold back, he has many other doors. When one door is closed, the others are open. And then the final verse here um, of our today's uh, tafsir is verse 25, that justice is the core of our deen. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلْ لَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْسُرُهُ مَنْ يَنْسُرُهُ وَرُسُلَهُ بِالْغَيْبِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ and we have already sent our messenger with clear evidences and send down with them the scripture and the balance so that they maintain their affairs in justice. And so this justice here is what the ummah, uh, uh, shohada, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about being shohada lillah and being shohada bil qist being uh, witnesses of Allah with justice and being witnesses for Allah with justice. And we send down iron, wherein is a great military might and benefit for the people, and so that Allah may make evident those who support him and his messengers, uh, in his messenger in things that are bil ghaib, in the unseen, 
indeed Allah is powerful, exalted in might. And so what we have here when Allah says, Laqad arsalna rusulana bil bayinat. What are these bayinat? Miracles. Allah sent his messengers with miracles and evidences and proof and truth. And he sent the revealed books. And with us is this revealed book, Al-Quran, as our miracle that we need to show humanity. Our, our bayinat, clarity that we need to show to the humanity. This ummah is given the amana. And we cannot fetch this amana on our back like previous nation, how they fetch it. And Allah described them like donkey carrying loads on their back. But this kitab is for mankind to read, understand, and carry out the wish of Allah in his book. Not to play around with, uh, you know, wording and semantics and so forth. It is really to understand the hukum and the purpose for which prophets were sent. And that is to establish justice. And to maintain their affairs in justice. And Allah, all Allah's messenger are united in justice. And he said, he sent down the iron, which is very powerful and beneficial for mankind. And to see who among us will, you know, really uh, support the cause of Allah and uh, you know to utilize what allah has given to us in these material things for the purpose of allah in allah and aziz and allah is all powerful and he is the strong and so this ayah really tells us that uh the uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging us to use the things that he has given to us for the benefit of mankind and for also for things that can be used to defend ourselves from the from anything that is evil that comes to us. And so the Muslims should be in the forefront in technology by using this example of hadith. And so uh, whether you do it or not, know that Allah is the Qawiyun Aziz. And so we will close here for now. The time uh, is very short for these. Uh, each one of you can go in a lot of details, but we close for now, inshallah, and we'll open for some few thoughts and few questions. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. So we'll move now to the Q&A session. So as we normally do, questions should be submitted via the webinar. So go to the questions tab in the webinar and type your questions um, there in writing and inshallah I'll moderate the Q&A session. So we'll begin inshallah with the first question. When we've reviewed the verses um, from Surah Al-Hadid today, we, they, they instill within us a level of concern about how we're spending our time in this world. What are the signs to recognize whether the time that we're spending in this life for this world is taking up more of a proportion of our affairs than it should. Yes, so when we look at how the amount of time we spend on uh, things that are non-productive, and the things that benefit. You see the hadith of the Prophet Al Kaisu Mandana Nafsahu wa Amila Lima Bad al Maut wal Ajizu Mantabia Nafsahu Hawa Hawaha wa Tamanna Allah. Uh the the wise man, he does the things that benefits him after he would have departed from this life. And so that's a very basic criteria. Going to work is a necessity. To take care of our family is part of ibadah. Uh, but certainly sitting and wasting three, four hours a day on your phone, chit-chatting with friends just to keep up with gossips and so forth, you know, sitting down and, and spending hours looking at, at television that brings no good to our, our soul. Um, and so you find that when you look at these things and you look at your prayer, and the prayer is very quick. As fast as you can get out from the prayer, you're, you're there. 
so I think those are indication where the soul is hooked. And if it is hooked more to these time-wasting things, then it is time for us to recognize that and do the things that are going to be more lasting. Well, the things that really remain, because all these other things, Allah says, they're like that garden, it wither ups and blows away, becomes nothing. What remains with us are the salihah, the good deeds. How, how would you encourage our teens to go to the masjid for prayer? Yes, uh, the, the, the teens, uh, they need to uh, understand, I think before they go to the masjid, uh, one of the biggest struggle that we have is to make these verses uh, because it comes from the heart. Uh, it does not come from the ear like, boy, you have to go to masjid. It really comes from the heart. Why are we going to the masjid? What's the purpose of this life? What's the purpose of uh, spending our time or wasting our life away? And then we can give a lot of examples of you know people die people return to allah they are young people they are people of all ages and so i think it has to come from verses like these where we really examine deep down within the core of our heart what is there is the desires to be fulfilled there or striving for the akhirah to be there so I think if we get down to the root of the issue and spend a lot of time, like how the Prophet ﷺ spent a lot of his uh, early years of dawah in the Makkan period, talking about tawheed, talking about punishment of Allah, talking about the akhirah, talking about Jannah, talking about Jahannam. And then the ahkam came little by little and towards the end, then a lot more ahkam came. And so, what is it that is within the heart uh, has to be rectified before the limbs can follow suit. Other than that, prayer also become a social event. Prayer also become, uh, you pray, but your mind is elsewhere. Your thoughts are elsewhere. And prayer becomes burdensome in that, in that case. So I think we go back to the root, which is, what is it we are striving for in this world? and spend a lot more time doing that. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit about the root word kuffar and how yeah, it kuffar, means yeah, someone yeah. who grows vegetation here? Yes, yes. You know, the word kuffar is a, also English word. A cover, you know, the word C-O-V-E-R, cover. It's, it comes from that. Uh, there are many words in English that its origin in fact, there was a there was a book once said that there are about ten thousand English words that has its root in Arabic language, and so cover kafara, okay. So from kafara you get cover, so it's to cover something. So when you plant uh, the seed in the soil, the kafar is the one who. Uh, puts it in the ground and cover it. All, all seeds that I know that you plant in the ground, you have to cover it. And then it shoots out from the ground and turns into a plant. And so that, that word or that process of uh, covering in a linguistic way, it is used for tillers or farmers. Um, it is also used to, in, uh, in an Akira sense, one who covers Iman with kufr. So every soul is born with this fitrah of recognizing Allah. And so covering that Iman and suppressing that Iman and pressing down that Iman and not allow that Iman to come out is a process of covering. And so kufar, you know, uh, comes in that, in that sense. So kufar has is used here in a linguistic sense that the kuffar who do the tilling of the land and they sow their seed and they, it turns into this beautiful garden and then it, it, it will dry up and then after that it becomes debris. Uh, so it's used in that, in that particular sense. 
Thank you. How do I convince myself that the acquisition of purely technical knowledge, such as having a PhD in computer science, and the dissemination and use of this knowledge when I graduate or teach or, or work is something spending my time on in this world, given that it's not purely Islamic Dawah work? Yes. Uh, what is Dawah work? <laughs> Uh, Dawa work is not just standing up with a flyer and say, brothers, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But the whole life is different, various manifestation and acts of Dawa. So it goes back to your intention. What is your intention when you have your PhD, when you have your degree, when you are qualified, whatever you do? So Yes, we have to work. As the hadith says that, uh, you know, there was a man who worked very passed by the Sahaba and the Prophet was there. And then the Sahaba said, wow, he looked like he worked very hard. And so the Prophet said, if he worked to take care of his himself, to prevent himself from begging others, then this is an, he, who of his, you know, he is uh, in the path of Allah. If he works to take care of his Parents, that is feasible. If he works to take care of his family, it is feasible. But if he works to show off and show he's a strong man and he can do this and he can do that, for who feasible the shaitan, then this is in the path of the devil. So working and doing our having all levels of uh, in the intellectual uh, capacity is very good. In fact, it is encourage for us to go and do that like the ayah is telling us but to take it and then you become the ultimate authority and you feel that you're big and proud with your your phd and you're big and proud that wherever you go you have to be recognized that you are you know it then you know it's it's really it goes back again what is deep down in the heart what is it we are striving for and so you find people who have little or nothing and they boast and brag of what they have. And you have people who will sit with you. They can be very rich and you don't even realize it. They can be extremely intelligent and you don't realize it because there is no boasting. It is utilizing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. The term iron was mentioned. What's the importance or lesson of iron connected to our life? Yes, um, uh, you know, the, this is quite amazing that, um, and there are some scientific uh, aspect of iron. Um, some Mufassiri, the earlier Mufassiri, they talk about iron um, being fihi ba'sun shadid. It has protection and protection for man's needs, for his spiritual needs. It is protection and thus you have in military defense in every country, in every society, you have a, a, a huge sum of their money is used to defend themselves. And so in defense, uh, iron, Allah brings about among the elements that he has given to us, iron, um, that, that does our protection, spiritual, our economic, political, all the protection comes from that. There are also benefit for mankind. And iron, in as much as it is powerful, it is also useful in what we, we do in our everyday life, building our buildings, building our means of transportation, things we use in the, in the kitchen or cutlery, all of these things, their source is coming from uh, this one element that Allah has given to us to show how powerful it can be used. Um, also, Allah brings about this concept of um, iron to show that power, uh, it is what he has given. At the end, in Allah Qawiyun Aziz, with all what you can use with iron, remember Allah is also the Qawiyun Aziz and he brings this both of his sifat of kuwa and izza, qawiyun aziz, 
in the same verse he's talking about the iron that we think also so all mankind don't think that all these military might that you have all this military power that you have all this great uses that you have for iron and if you take away iron i don't know where we will be in the world maybe still in mud houses but all of this you're using for your life remember the one who is giving this power to that the one who has created it is the one who is qawi is strong and aziz powerful so don't feel too overly excited about this hadith okay it is good for you it is to defend yourself from your enemies but at the same time know that allah is the qawi and aziz don't put it on the material things don't put it on the created things also remember the creator who gives that uh, element for us to use do you think it's acceptable that someone like me who wants to work from home so that i may be able to fulfill my obligations to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um and i have this sincere wish to do so by staying at home is this acceptable if you have a job that you can do from home and you can fulfill your, your everyday needs and you can fulfill your serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether you are at home or you are going to work, you you do that. I mean, dawah is not confined and this, this life is not confined only to me. Remember, these verses are telling us about racing to get the maqfira and the rahma and the jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't uh, think that just because if you think I can be secluded from the rest of the world and go through this competition, you will be running alone. So if, you know, there will be times, yes, you can work at home, you get your your daily bread, and uh, taking care of your family. At the same time, you have this uh, ability, you can write, you can research, you can do dawah on your computer, you can invite people, you can come with ideas. That also is possible. Meet, you go to the masjid, you meet people. So it's not like being at home uh, would mean you cut off from any of these responsibilities. In fact, if you're at home in this world today with your computer, with your phone, you can communicate a wide range of communication. So don't think that being at home is only for self-purification. Um, it also has the dawah aspect and you also need to get out and go outside and meet others physically. So dawah is, uh, has a variety of ways and means to reach the other person, to let him know what the meaning of life is and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do I concentrate on my prayers? Because sometimes I feel like I'm showing off, which I don't want to. How do I focus instead of thinking about dunya during prayers? Yes, you know, this is one of the greatest struggle for especially living in a uh, in a time of materialism where it enters the heart and so from the time you say allahu akbar you uh think about everything dunyawi you think about what has just happened what has happened what is happening what will happen and so your heart you leave the prayer and you're absolutely empty now that does not mean that you give up because you are unable to pray properly what it means that you have to strive to focus in your prayer and to focus in your prayer is to know what you are saying in your prayer so simple things like understanding the concepts in surah fatiha what you say in your ruku what you say in your sujood what you say in your attahiyat and try your best to know that you are standing in front of Allah who is watching you. If you are driving and a police, you look in your rear view mirror and you see a police car immediately behind you. 
and you have a suspended license, you have some tickets that you did not pay before, and you have some sins, how do you drive when the police is behind you? Because you're conscious of the fact that someone is watching you. So you have to develop that consciousness that Allah is reading what is in my mind. He knows what I'm thinking in my prayer. So one of my students once said to me, Sheikh, would it be nice if we can see on a screen what is going on in people's mind as they're praying? I said, you would like to see what goes on uh, in, in, in people's mind as they're praying. You might see the most uh, hilarious or the most horrific or the most offensive or the most evil of things that go on in people's mind as they stand up there and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, this is when shaitan comes and plays with your mind tremendously. And so, uh, dear brothers, um, there are things that you really have to work on. And prayer is one of the most, uh, the highest act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to treat it as I'm standing in front of Allah and Allah is watching. me. And it takes time. Changing inside of you, it takes tremendous effort. And so rushing into prayer, want to get out of prayer, is not really true prayer. Your heart does not feel tranquil if, oh my God, I have to go meet this brother. Or while you're coming in, you see that brother and you have to talk to that brother and some business deal is going on and some, and then you are trying to finish to make sure you'd catch the brother before he leaves the prayer. This is not, what is this prayer? You know, so I think it has to go back to your, your focus that when I'm standing in front of Allah, as the Prophet said, uh, you must stand there, you must worship Allah as if he is watching you. And even if he's not watching you, even you cannot see him, you must be very sure he is watching you. So I think developing that um, inner dimension of your prayer is how you can be able to overcome little by little. It's not going to happen overnight. But little by little, don't you know in Ramadan, it becomes a lot easier. So, so working for 29, 30 days in Ramadan should help us if we do it with the right focus to help us to develop that consciousness of Allah in our soul. And it is not just our what is on the phone. And some brothers have the a, a habit as soon as they make uh, assalamu alaikum rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. The first thing before they even begin to do zikr of Allah, they take out their phone. What did I miss? What do you miss? Somebody calling you to ask you some stars or some latest uh, movie or some, is that what you're going to, is that the substitute for sitting down and spending some time doing the zikr of Allah and letting the heart rest in peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as opposed to the heart agitating who might be calling me when I'm praying. This is this is uh, uh, shaitan coming and making all those mischief in our mind. So we have the we have the solution, but it's just that we have to turn off that equipment that takes us away from Allah and turn on the inner soul that connects up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unless we do that switch, then they will be back and forth, back and forth, and our mind will be on all of these, uh, what did I miss, who did I call, who did who called me when I was there? And I have seen people answering phone while they're praying. In the Salatul Tarawih, you know, you sometimes you go to make wudu and come back, and people are standing up in the line, I'm praying, I'll call you when I'm done. I mean, is it so important, what, to go buy a loaf of bread and come home? Is that so important that you cannot wait for till the person is finished? Okay, um, this will be the final question, inshallah. Um, I'm concerned about the state of my heart. Um, I feel my heart um, may be a negligent heart. Uh, is this a normal feeling to have for a Muslim? Yes. Uh, and if so, what should I do about my heart? This is a sign of Iman. Really, it is a sign that you have some Iman in your heart. If you can diagnose your failing of the heart, you have already crossed half of your journey. 
because the problem with that life can be a delusion. The life can make you deluded to such a point that you become self-deluded. That, you know, I pray, I this, I that, and I'm fine. I mean, I'm a good Muslim, I'm fine. But when you start to recognize that I have an ailing heart, this is a sign. And there is a, a, a statement of Aisha radiallahu anha that when you start to feel that your iman is getting low, um, know that this is when it's a sign of your iman getting increased. So in other words, recognizing it is almost half of your journey towards rectifying it. And anybody who spends time to figure out that uh, my heart is ailing will also find that time to try anything that will rectify that heart. But if we are in a state of ghafla, in a state of negligence, then there is no, there is no, you know, that alone is telling you you are intoxicated. You know, you do not have, you think that you are, you know, this is self-piety, self-righteousness and you are already self-deluded. So I think a, if a brother or sister, whoever asked that question, if your heart, if you feel your heart is going um, down, like what Hanzala, you know, he was, um, you know, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu and said, Nafaka Hanzala. So he, Hanzala has committed uh, Nifaq. And Prophet Sallallahu said, why? He said, well, you know, when I'm with you and I'm in your gathering, I feel so spiritual, like, you know, we are in this tafsir session, you feel good. But once I, you know, go home with my family, I, you know, I I just, everything like goes back to normal. So he said, Sa'atan wa sa'ya handala. There's a time for this, there's a time for that. And so you, you recognize that there is a time um, that, you worship Allah, you try to get your heart there. And there's a time if you go, uh, if you do some searching of your soul and you find your heart is, is going down, going down, and you can recognize that, that is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Glorify Allah, thank Allah, make dua, and work to have a better next day than what you had today. Jazakallah khair, I'm Sheikh Abdurrahman. Um, mashallah, this was very beneficial. Uh, we'll conclude here. Uh, we'll resume again next week at the same time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll be studying next week uh, verses 1 to 10 of Surah Al-Ankabut, uh, and this will be delivered by Brother Yasser Ali. With that, we'll conclude. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal asr inna l-insana lafi khus illa al-lazina amanu wa amilu s-salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.